All righty, if you have a Bible with you this morning, we're going to speak just a little bit um, through the Word of God about the resurrection of Jesus. I've kind of changed this a little bit to accommodate some principles that I feel the Holy Spirit wants uh, this particular body of believers uh, to know and to walk in. Uh, it is my strong, strong belief that the Lord wants you to be victorious. I don't believe that, um, like some people do, that poverty is a blessing and a curse, and that um, bearing sickness is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, I believe that God has come in the form of Jesus Christ to this earth, that you might have life and have life in great abundance and that the power of the Lord to create that life is our dependency. It is not creating a great life for yourself. It is depending on the Lord to live his life through you, which is always a great experience and a great way to live your days out on the earth. That you would know the Lord, you would know his will for your life, you would know his plan for your life, and you would be able to execute that plan day by day, hour by hour, as you live out your days. And the important thing is that we do what the Lord has called us to do. And I feel like many people, especially Americans, are never fulfilled, and they're never quite happy about anything. They never quite have enough of everything they want to have. And it's frustrating because you never quite get there. It's always reaching for the carrot that is just a little bit out of your grasp and a little bit out of your reach. And many people are frustrated because they can't really find happiness in chasing the American dream. Although many people take up that mantle and challenge and try to do that. They try to chase the dream of a happy life with a lot of stuff. But you know, the reality is, is that true fulfillment, true peace, true destiny lies within our ability to walk out our days knowing the Lord and doing his will. When you are doing the will of God in your life, you will never be happier. When we are not doing the will of God, you'll never be more frustrated. So the barometer is like an oil. Well, you check your oil. It's like a little dipstick. Your barometer is stick there that dipstick in and find out if there's any oil on your stick. Because any vehicle, you gentlemen know, any vehicle that runs without oil long enough is going to break down at some point. And the oil of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Lord in our life, really is the key to the power of fulfillment so that we would be at peace. And the Lord said that he would be able to give us a kind of a peace that would pass understanding. Many times we have a human understanding of what it would be like for us to finally be peaceful with something. But the Lord said, I have a way for you on this earth, not in heaven only, but while you are here, to find a supernatural peace that passes your ability to understand it. You would think that having a lot of stuff, you could understand that, that would try to make you happy. But the Lord says, no, not that way. That peace that passes understanding comes from an abiding relationship that produces an action of following the Lord in the earth and doing his will in the earth. And I believe, from my experience, personally and from my counseling experience, that many people are not happy because they're out of the will of God. And I find that the most happy, most fulfilled people that I know are people that are in the will of God. They know it. They know they're in the will of God. And everything is peaceful. There's a lack of anger, a lack of tension, a lack of frustration. That is just tangible. So there's a goal 
in resurrection. Resurrection has a power. And that resurrection, this Greek word, anastasis, is the word for resurrection. It means a, a mutating or changing of the state that you are in. A complete revolution from what it was to what it currently is. Such as the resurrection of the life and the body of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was resurrected, and this is one of the most profound things about the resurrection, there are many people in the first century, second century, called docetists, and they studied docetism, which says that Jesus was God, but he came to earth as Jesus God in the spirit, and that he really wasn't a man. He was just God walking around. So when he was resurrected, he wasn't resurrected bodily so much as he was resurrected spiritually. Do not get caught in the trap of docetism. Jesus was, and this is very difficult to explain, but look at it this way. He was not 50% God and 50% man. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. This is hard to understand in many ways. They not only called him the son of God and the son of David, they also called him the son of man. And there was a reason why that's in the Bible like that. And that when Jesus was resurrected, he was not only resurrected spiritually, so to speak, he was resurrected in the body. And this is important to understand because you are going to be resurrected in the body. You are not only spirit and soul, which compromises and makes up, composes who you are. This is how you talk. This is how you think. This is your seat of understanding. This is the way you rationalize and understand things. Your soul and your spirit. Your soul is your personality. It's your mind. It's how you think. And your spirit is the part of, of God in you that is life. It actually makes you animated. It gives you life. When your spirit is taken out of you, you're gone. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say to the Father? Lord, into your hands I commend my, my spirit. I commend my spirit into your hands. When Jesus was resurrected, this was the thing that made it so incredible. He was resurrected bodily. And this is important to understand because there's many, many, many false doctrines running around, some in the church, but much in the world, in, the, in atheist, that talk about all different kinds of things that happened to Jesus except his bodily resurrection. But I want to encourage you that when he was brought forth out of that tomb, he had a new body. A brand new body. He went in with the body he was born with on the earth. A physical, tangible body that ate and slept and drank. And when he came out of that tomb, he came out of it with a morphed body, a different body. An anastasis happened to him in which even his own disciples could not recognize the fact that it was him. It had changed. It was a different type of body. It was a resurrected body. Now, it's interesting that in the miracles that Jesus produced when he was resurrecting men and women and children, when he was in his ministry resurrecting people like Lazarus and Jairus' daughter, when they were resurrected, they were resurrected not into their resurrected body. They were brought back to life in their own bodies, and they were identifiable and recognizable by everybody that was in town. But Jesus came back in an anastasis type of body, a different kind of body. And when he came back, he was walking on the road to Emmaus. He had two of his regular disciples were on that road with him. And he started walking along with them, just appeared and started walking along with them. And they were down in the dumps and they were dragging their jaw because of the news 
and what had happened to Jesus and everything like that. They didn't know who he was. And they were talking with him like he was just another regular guy. And it wasn't until he broke bread with them that the Holy Spirit opened up their eyes and they were able to see past the physical and see who he actually was, the resurrected Christ. Doubting Thomas, when Jesus came and walked through the wall and appeared before his disciples, and all of the disciples, some of them had mixed emotions, and Thomas was one of them. He saw what was going on. He knew what the story was about the, the death part. And then here is this quote-unquote man standing in the room trying to tell him that he was the Messiah and he was Jesus. And, he, and Thomas couldn't bring himself to, to believe that because he couldn't see the old Jesus. The old Jesus had gone. And he couldn't identify and he couldn't kind of figure out in his mind what was going on. It wasn't until Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Touch that. And when Thomas identified the hole in Jesus' wrists from his crucifixion, he fell down on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. He knew at that point in time. So one of the things that you have to look forward to, and this is a, a, an incredible thing, the day is going to come, mark my words, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you believe that he is resurrected from the dead, which, by the way, is part of the commitment of faith to be born again when you confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 9, and 10 is very clear on this. With the mouth a man confesses, with the heart he believes, and what he confesses is that Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, but that he was also resurrected from the dead. Resurrection is the center point of Christianity. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. It's just another good speaker, another moral and ethical man who spoke to the nation of Israel. However, the resurrection proves beyond a shadow of a doubt every single thing and validifies every single word that Jesus Christ spoke. And everything he did was validified in the resurrection. And you, you and I, are going to experience an anastasis because of your belief, not only in Jesus as the Son of God, but also in, in the resurrection, in his resurrection that you too will be the second fruits and third fruits and fourth fruits, etc. In this great, incredible day that is coming down the road when we will all be resurrected and walking with the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. That's going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. But what you have to see is that what you have, what you're carrying around now will not be identifiable as your resurrected body, but you will be identifiable, just the same way Jesus was. So let me give you an example. When you're in heaven, and you're in your resurrected body, and your resurrected body will be like Jesus' resurrected body was on this earth, not like Lazarus' resurrected body, but like Jesus' resurrected body, and you will be able to communicate You'll be able to know things. The Bible says you will fully know, even as you are fully known. You'll be able to identify individuals who have been born again, whose names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And now I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be always. We will be with the Lord. He has prepared a place for you. You're going there, but you're not going here with this thing. This old thing that gets sick. This old thing that, that gets old and gray and loses a few hairs here and there. You're not going with that thing. You're going with a brand new body. And when you get there, 
the ones who went before you, who have already have been in a state of being with the Lord, are going to be identifiable to you. So some of you have fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, people that you've loved. The Lord is going to open up your eyes and open up theirs, and you're going to be able to identify one another in this resurrected power and this resurrected format. It's going to be a great day. Um, there was also um, many theories in the first and second century. Of course, a lot of them were perpetrated by uh, atheists and um, people of different religions to negate the fact that Jesus was uh, resurrected or that he was dead at all. How many of you have ever heard the term swoon theory? Swoon theory. Nobody's heard that in here? Well, okay, one person, Tommy. Mark, okay. Let me tell you a little bit about the swoon theory. This became popular um, in the second century AD. This is not that long after Jesus was resurrected. And the swoon, swoon theory came up, was, was brought up mostly by Jewish people in that time, but um, it, it caught on in, uh, in other areas as well to negate the resurrection. And what it is, is that Jesus went to the cross. He was Everything that was said, because of all the eyewitnesses, could not be denied. So all of the whipping with the cat of nine tails on the back, all of the crown of thorns pressed into his forehead, all of the, the, the pulling of the beard out so his face would bleed and punching and spitting on him and all the things that actually happened to Jesus, they believe all that actually happened. And that when he went up on the cross... We know that he hung on the cross for not, uh, approximately nine hours. I had him get him down by sundown. Started off at 9 a.m. in the morning, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he had given up his spirit. So he, had, he, he lived six hours on the cross, probably hung on the cross, up until sunset of that day, and then they rushed to get him down because it was the high Sabbath the next day. Couldn't take him down, couldn't do any work. That's Jewish people. So he's nine hours up there. Now, what the, the swoon theory says is that when Jesus was on the cross, he suffered greatly, but he only was on there nine hours, and it took more than that to crucify other people historically. Some guys would be on the cross for two days suffering, some three, and then wind up dying after three days on the cross. Jesus died in six hours. And I said the number of man is six, so Jesus died for, for mankind as well, and that when they pulled him down off of the cross and they took him to the tomb, the tomb was damp, it was cold, and somehow, some way, it revived him. After he had gone through all that stuff, then he really wasn't dead on the cross. But somehow, it revived him. The coolness of the tomb and, you know, the being in a state of rest and being off the cross, and somehow he caught his breath and walked out of the tomb and was never heard from or seen again from that particular day. That's a ludicrous, ludicrous concept, but there are people that believe it. I want to show you uh, something that, that I love. It's in the book of Revelation. Chris, if you want to follow me on this, Revelation chapter 1. This is the most beautiful set of scriptures talking about the Apostle John, who was very old at this point in time. He was probably well into his 90s at this point in time. As a matter of fact, they think that this book was written in 90 AD, somewhere around there. And they think that he was probably 14 years old um, or... or uh, or 12, 11 or 12 years old, either one. Some people think that he was not bar mitzvah yet at that point in time. He had not become a man in Jewish society yet at that point in time. So that's why Jesus said, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son, speaking of John. He had to be taken care of. He wasn't a man yet. So he's very old at this point in time. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He got put there because he was preaching the word. And standing up for the name of Jesus. So they exiled him to this island. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day, he says. 
He's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I want to kind of just uh, point that out. Go to verse 10, Chris. We'll just go skip right over there. Verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, stop there for a second. We're talking about the Holy Spirit here that he was in. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is a powerful apostle of Jesus Christ. He says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What is he in every other day if he's not in the Spirit on every other day? The logic of it being that he is saying that he was in a state of being in the presence of the Lord, being in the Spirit, just like you and I can be in the Spirit at any given time. If you go to your house today, after church, you go into your closet, you shut the door, you start worshiping, thanking God, and start praying, in a short period of time, you will be in the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will come down upon you. The Spirit of the Lord will inundate you. It will cover you. He will manifest himself in your life. How many of you in this room have ever in some service or some closet or some prayer room or something been in the Spirit? You know what I'm talking about. And then when you're shopping at Publix, you don't seem to be in the Spirit. You seem to be thinking about something else. It's an indication that the Holy Spirit can literally fall on a person inundate a person, fill or infill a person at a specific period of time. It's very important to understand that because there are people in the body of Christ that believe there is no being in the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, that's the end of the story. But that's not completely accurate to this text. So he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And behind me, a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet. And it said, write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. I, I love that phraseology there because it's speaking of the heavenly language that we will all speak someday. There won't be any language barrier. You know that, right? So all your Spanish brothers and all your Russian brothers and all your Chinese brothers, when you go to heaven, all those languages will be gone. Those languages come out of a form of knowledge, and that knowledge will be done away with. When you communicate, you'll be speaking in a heavenly language angelic language that everybody will understand and be understood in. So if Jesus' voice now is like the sound of many waters. <laughs> when I first read this, it really kind of quickened to me because I was in a meeting one time in Daytona Beach, Florida. It was men only, but there was 1,200 men only in this building. And it was a, a, it was a, a, a sort of like a teaching type rally and we were worshiping the Lord and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just fell on the place <sighs> just, and like a waterfall just hit 1200 men and everybody started at the top of their lungs praying and singing in the Holy Spirit 
And to me, and I was sitting right in the middle of the whole thing, to me, it sounded like the sound of many waters. Anybody ever been next to a waterfall before? Or a babbling, rushing brook? The Colorado River is a very good example of that. It sounds incredible. It's almost like something speaking, but it's not really speaking. The sound of many waters. You're going to hear that sound someday. And then he observes that in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in all of its strength. And when I saw him, I fell dead at his feet. And he laid his right hand upon me and say, said this, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, Alpha and Omega. And the living one. And then he makes this statement. I was dead. This is Jesus speaking in heaven. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and hell. This is very important to understand. This is speaking of what was accomplished at the cross and through the resurrection. That at the cross, Jesus was literally killed, not put to sleep, not swooning, not temporarily under. He was literally, totally dead, completely. Separated from God, completely. And in that context, he defeated, because he was the Messiah, he defeated death and hell. Now, Satan, prior to that, had the keys of death and hell. Jesus, at the cross, took the keys away from him and proved that the grave could not hold a person. A Satan could not keep him in the grave. And he has these keys. He walks around with these keys in his hand. And keys are emblematic of authority. They get you into places. You're the owner when you have the keys. You can unlock, you can open, you can close. Jesus is walking around with the keys of death and hell in his hands. He has mastered them on our behalf. Which means then that you and I, through the direct act of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Death cannot hold you in the grave any longer. Satan cannot hold you hostage any longer. Death no longer has any power over you once you are born again. You remember that old saying? If you're only born once in your life, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you will only die once. You can be born of your mother, but you must be born of the Spirit, born again. And if you are born twice, the only thing that can go on you is this old rag, this old tent, the Apostle Paul said, and you will give it up when this tent is taken down, Paul says, but you will receive a new, incredibly more beautiful tent to walk around in in heaven. So it's important for us to understand that Jesus indicated in the book of Revelation that he was dead. This should have put an end to all the controversies of the first, second, and third century, all the docetism, all the dualism that was running about confusing all the Christians, but it didn't. As many people still followed after the heresies of the day. Jesus 
says, I have the keys of death and hell in his hand. In Hebrews chapter 6, I want you to see something if you just kind of flip with me there. Chris, Hebrews uh, chapter 6 in New American Standard, verse 1 <coughs> through 6. It says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, how many of you know there is elementary or foundational teachings about Jesus that everybody should know? <laughs> and what he's saying, this is elementary. How many went to elementary school? What do you learn in elementary school? The elementary things. That's right, reading, writing, arithmetic. That's what you learn in elementary school. But you don't learn that in college, high school and college, and graduate school. You have to learn something different on those levels. Deeper, wiser. But this apostle who wrote this book, could be Barnabas, could be Paul, but whoever wrote it had a great understanding about Jesus and about what we should know about him. And he says, therefore, I'm going to leave the elementary principles about Jesus. You should be past that by now. Let us now press on to maturity. Maturity, being more mature. Not only singing this song, and this is a wonderful thing. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. But you can sing that when you're first born again. But you know what? When you're 30 years old in the Lord, you better have some other understandings that are more mature than just the elemental principles. This is why people, why you're seeing Christians doing stuff that you say, that's... How can you do that? You've been, how long have you been a Christian? Well, 25 years, and you're still doing that? You have passed out of the mature and back into the elementary. Yeah, but you know, Jesus still loves me. He's going to forgive me of my sins. So, like this joint up for me, won't you? What, what's the person saying? They are still in the elemental understandings of Jesus. Jesus got grace. I'm, I can't work my way to heaven, so I can do anything I want to do. So you go around sleeping with boys. You go around sleeping with girls. You say, well, you know, Jesus will forgive me. You cheat on your taxes. You do all these kind of different things. And what happens, what winds up happening is that we fail to move forward. We fail to press on into the deeper things of the Lord. And nobody, believe me, nobody who's ever born on this earth is ever meant to stay a baby. No one here is meant to stay infantile. When the church was born on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost. What happened on that day? The church had a birthday. It was born. Holy Spirit came into church. We call it church. Koriakos. The church was born. But how many of you know the Lord never intended the church to stay like it was on that first day? That we were to grow in the wisdom and the knowledge and the person of Jesus Christ. It's a dynamic. Faith is a dynamic. He says, therefore, I want you to leave the elementary teachings. And it's amazing to me that you can leave the elementary teachings, move on to the next level, level and never really forget the foundations that you walk on. You don't, you don't enter into the next level by forgetting the past. <clears throat> he says, press on to maturity. And watch what he says here. Not laying again... A foundation of repentance. Everybody should be walking in that. Two, faith towards God. Everybody should be growing in your faith. We should all, every day, as we are challenged by different things in life, we should be able to be growing in our faith. When you start off, you can pray for a headache to be healed. And keep working on that. That's a good thing. But the day will come when you continue to grow in that, 
where you start praying for more deeper and more serious things like cancer, for example. But you grow and you expand in that area in faith. And then he says, number two, verse two, instructions about washings. Some might, Bibles might say, but the word there is baptismon. And that's a, um, kind of an extended word out from baptisma, which means baptisms, literally in the plural. Baptisma is the singular. Baptismon is the plural of the word baptisms. How many of you know there are more than one baptism? There are many churches that believe there's only one baptism. You get it saved, you get dipped in the water, the deal's over, you're done, you're baptized. I don't know why they would use the plural word baptisms here, other than the fact that there are more than one baptisms. Could it possibly be there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit that some people could be leaving out of that sentence? Could it possibly be there's a baptism of sufferings that even Jesus suffered? If you look at a word study of when Jesus was on the was uh, heading towards the cross, speaking to his disciples. He says, are you ready to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with, using three different words? So there's more to it. And I want to suggest to you, there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit, just like there's a baptism in water. He says, so you should be past that. You should have moved on from that controversy a long time ago. And only the kids are still fighting about it. But the adults have moved on. And then he says, and of laying on of hands, which we spoke about several weeks back in here. Why is it so valuable to understand that laying on of hands is an elemental, foundational, fundamental truth of Christianity? And why doesn't the church lay hands on anybody? Why don't parents lay their hands on their children? Why don't elders lay hands upon the sick? Looks like the devil figured that one out real quick. He's like, I gotta stop this from happening. So all of a sudden, nobody does that anymore either. But as you clearly see in if, um, Hebrews 6, it's part of your foundations and your elementary teachings. Should have got that in elementary school. Why? Because the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. And in many instances and in situations, the Lord will use you to put your hand on another person and transmit the power of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. That's how people get ordained. That's how people get set in ministry. And remember the prophet who was buried in the grave, and somebody fell down into the grave. Dead body, they threw the dead body into the grave. What happened to the dead body when it touched the prophet's body? It came back to life. He came back to life. It's one of the resurrections. He touched a dead prophet and came to life. There's something about that that's elemental. That's why healing is so important to lay your hands upon people when you're praying for them to be healed. He says, um, laying on of hands. And then the, the fifth one that he says, end of the resurrection of the dead. The and, and, and eternal judgment is the last thing, but the resurrection of the dead is what we're focusing on. He says, do you know and do you realize that the elementary teachings about your Christianity rotate around your understanding of the resurrection of the dead? that you and I would understand that this is a key fundamental aspect of Christianity. And that resurrection is not only just for a body to be changed into another body. Resurrection in and of itself is an entire principle. It's an entire principle that the Lord wants us to know and understand. So I want to share with you something um, that I felt like the Lord gave me specifically for the, for the church here today. And then we'll kind of bring this to a close this morning. It says this. 
The resurrection is not only a physical reality that changes physical death into life. It also is a kingdom principle that states this, that God can always change <clears throat> the inf- <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the devil trying to stop me from saying that, which states that God can always change the inferior to the superior, the worst to the best, the lowest to the highest, and defeat into victory. This is the principle of resurrection that is found in all Christians and all of Christianity. That God has the power to change. And that's what that word anastasis really means. The word for resurrection. To change it all. God can change an inferior thing to a superior thing. I want you to think of something in your life this morning that you judge as inferior. That you cannot change. I'm going to suggest to you that God can change it to the superior. Secondarily, the worst to the best. God can make something that is your worst nightmare. Your best day ever. It's happened to me. It's probably happened to many people in this room. But God can do it. He can change the lowest to the highest, and he can change every defeat into a victory. Matter of fact, I believe that many defeats are designed by God to produce a greater victory. That God allows defeat to show you the difference between defeat and victory. But God always grants the victory. In all these things, as the Bible says, we are more than conquerors through him who has called us. More than conquerors. This morning is Resurrection Sunday. This morning is the time to change something that's dead, old, stinky into something that is incredibly beautiful. Something with feet like burnished bronze and hair like white wool, like snow. Something incredibly beautiful. Out of a mess, God always makes a wonderful recipe for the future. So what I, what I asked the Lord about this, this day, I said, Lord, you know, this, this resurrection teaching, we can talk about the widow of Nain and all of the things that happen with resurrection. But what do you want to do? And I heard the Lord say to me, he says, I want to change my people's worst into their best. I want to change their defeats into victories. I want to let them know that I want to take the reins of their life instead of them trying to fix something that they cannot fix. And sometimes, guys, between you and I, and those of you who are watching, sometimes the truth is you can't fix something that only God can fix. You may be in a situation in your life right now that is absolutely frustrating, stagnant, mediocre, full of defeat. You may find yourself stuck in the mud. And the the fact of the matter is, is that in your human intellect, there's no way to figure it out. There's no way to change anything. But there is a way. With God, not some things are possible, All things are possible through God. And if you let him, and this is what I kind of sensed in the spirit about this day. There are reins. You know what reins are? Reins are indicative of control. That's all that is. If you have a horse and you got reins on the horse, what is the purpose of the reins? It's to control the horse. When you pull the reins, the horse stops. When you snap the reins, the horse goes. When you tug on one the right side, the horse turns. The reins are control. When we have the reins of our life, 
What is that saying to the Lord? Say, Lord, you know, I think you, you know, you did a great job there on the cross, and it's really great about that resurrection thing. It's really nice to know that I'm going to heaven. But about that rain thing, about that control, about what I do with my life, about that part, I think I'm going to hang on to that. Because I don't really quite trust something I really don't see. And this is where the Lord comes in on a resurrection Sunday morning and says, don't you know that I can change a dead body into a live one? Don't you know that I can take your worst nightmare and make it your best dream? <clears throat> if you don't trust me for that, how in the world can you trust me for your resurrection that you've never seen? It's impossible. You can't trust the Lord with all. You're, you, we're only saying that we are. The Bible says, he who is faithful in a little thing will be faithful in much, not the opposite way around. So ultimately, the Lord wants something from us today. I feel like it rains. The reason I feel that is because of what he said. It's what he said to me about this congregation. He wants the rains. We can be a nice little church congregation, Spring Hill, Tennessee. We've got incredibly talented people. It's going to grow. It's going to be wonderful, and everybody's going to be happy. Or we can live directly in the purposes of God, in which every day will be a new adventure. But all has to do about the rains and who's in control. God will not lead a person who is controlling themselves. You can just hang around the things of Christianity, but you can't be in them. So when you're holding on to the reins, you are in control. You're driving. But when the person who is sitting next to you, hence the word parakletos, the Holy Spirit, when the Lord is sitting next to you, and you say, you know what, Lord, this is a treacherous journey, down the hills of this life, I'm going to give you the reins and just sit here. You ever see that bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? You ever see that before? If you have that bumper sticker, take it off your car. That's absolutely wrong. God is not your co-pilot. He's the pilot. You're the co-pilot if anything, but you are not the pilot when God is flying the plane or when he is riding the carriage. So somehow, some way, this morning, I want you to see this in the spirit. You personally with the Lord. I'm not yelling at you, not rebuking anybody, but I want you to see this in the spirit. What reins do you have in your hand? And can you take those reins today and just go, here, you drive and give up control. You fly the plane. I'll sit here. And wherever you take me, <laughs> that's where I'm going. You know the problem with, with um, control is? Is people are control freaks because they think they know where they want to go. So they have to get there. They have their own goals. But the, the funny thing about the Lord is that he says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the direction I want to take you. Give me the reins. Let me take you there. Can you trust me for that? Can you trust me for the rest of your days to drive you to the place you really should be as opposed to what you think it should be? And if you can say yes to that question today, you can transfer the reins over. So with that, I want you to stand up with me, if you will. Remembering above and beyond all things this incredible miracle of resurrection, anastasis, what really happened there? That was no dog and pony show. There was no tricks involved there. God released the power to change death to life.
from bad to good, from defeat to victory. So I want you to bow your heads for one moment, if you will. This is your day for the Lord. This is not anything with me. Bow your heads before the Lord. He's here. <clears throat> Wherever the word of God is spoken, he's going to be there. Wherever two or more are in agreement, he's here. The worship today was so incredible to me. All the dances and the songs and the music and things. I know that the Lord's train was filling the temple. The Lord was walking around. His train was filling the temple. This little building here. we here right now. And you have an opportunity, an incredible opportunity on one of the most incredible days of all Christianity. To actually turn over your life and the control of your life to him and let him resurrect a brand new direction for you today. So when you're thinking, I want you to think about one area in your life that you are really in control of. And then generally, if you are in control of anything, and I want you to submit it to the Lord if you can do this. If you can't, don't do it. The Lord's not going to be tricked. You're not going to fool him. If it's in your heart this morning to say, hey, Lord, you know, I didn't have the faith. I didn't understand. These words were too hard. I didn't trust you. Can you be honest enough to say to the Lord, Lord, I didn't trust you. But Lord, today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I see something different going on in the heavens. And I want to be, Lord, walking in your purposes for my life. So I give up control. And then I just want you to take a minute to kind of verbalize that in your spirit and say to the Lord, Lord, here's the area. Pride, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, laziness, all of these things that are what they call capital sins before the Lord. Anger is a form of control. You can manipulate people with your anger easily. Selfishness and pride are the most abominable things to the Lord when we put ourselves before him and others. And when we think that we don't need the cross, and we don't need the resurrection. Lord, today, as we present these areas of our life to you, we know, Lord, you can do anything. You have the power, Lord, to change even the way we are. But you always ask for our agreement. You always ask, Lord, for our will and our assent. And whatever we agree to, Lord, you do. It's the most amazing thing that you never force us to be Christians or act like Christians. So today, oh Lord, in these areas that we release. We ask you, Lord, to do a resurrection miracle for those, Lords, whose finances have collapsed and curses of poverty have fallen upon them, Lord, through self-imposed curses. I ask, oh Lord, today that you reverse that curse through the power of your resurrection and you cause that which is lack to now prosper. That which was the tail now become the head in Jesus' name. I ask, O oh Lord, for those, Lord, who have, who have put themselves, Lord, before you. Today, O oh Lord, you would accept the reins of our lives back into your hands. And you would speak to us as deep calls unto deep and change our direction. You know, there's, old, there's an old saying that says you can never change your direction without first changing your mind. 
And today, Lord, we change our mind. We give you the reins. And the biggest one of all today, I feel, is the last one I'm going to say. It's the word fear. The Lord says there is fear in just about every single person in the church. Fear is the enemy's song that he sings to the people of God. Fear will cause you not to do something that you should do. Fear will hold you back. Fear will immobilize you in the spirit. Fear can paralyze you from being who you are in Jesus Christ. Fear of man. Fear of death. When the Lord says, I have the keys to that in my hand. Today, don't fear. Fear of disease. Fear of being destitute. Fear of losing everything. It's all voices of the enemy. When the Lord says, when you're in my army, you are covered. So Lord, right now, this power and the spirit of fear, we release to you. So I will not hold on to this any longer. I give you the reins, O oh Lord. I give you the steering wheel. You're the pilots. Today, Lord, I resign from being the pilot of my life. I resign from being the driver of my vehicle. And I say, Lord, you drive. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have turned something over to the Lord this morning, I want you to uh, kind of look for the result of that in the way you live your life in the next days ahead, the next weeks ahead. Look, always look for the result of what you pray for and what you ask for. Never pray and forget. Never ask and walk away. Always look. If you're a farmer, you plant a seed. Don't you kind of look to see if it's going to grow? You don't go, you say, I'll plant a seed, I'm going to leave now. I'm not coming back again. You don't do that. One of the things about prayer that I see that is really affecting a lot of people is people say, well, I prayed about that. And I, I always ask them, well, did you look for the answer? Well, no. I mean, well, am I supposed to do that too? If you pray, if you plant something, doesn't even a farmer look for a harvest when you plant something? Look, look. Seek the Lord while yet he might be found. That's one of our relational objectives is to seek the Lord. Check him out. Don't leave him hanging there. He's looking to communicate in these areas. Amen. God bless you all. Now, this week is a big week, and um, we'll see you at Dave Ramsey's. Okay? Give somebody a hug on your way out. And Stephen, if you can give me a resurrection song. <laughs>